Here I would like to reprise the topic of self-insertion, but more specifically, I want to talk about it within the context of what fantasy actually is. Now, time and again, one will read, and I saw in the comment section on that particular video, and elsewhere, this is nothing new, that fantasy by and large, uh, those who self-insert and those who participate in fantasy are engaging in a form of escapism. And on the surface, this seems like the correct answer. It seems to be exactly that. People who self-insert uh, are engaged in a form of escapism. I think that's a limited view, and I think it is actually an inaccurate view. And here I will go against the grain of convention, but that is, of course, uh, for me, nothing new. I think it's a misnomer and a misleading train of thought to think that most people pursue fantasy uh, for the sake of escapism. We have to first ask ourselves, what is fantasy? Is fantasy the formulation of, uh, of escapism as a concept, or is it something else? Well, to my mind, fantasy is a little bit more complex than that. Fantasy is ultimately a collection of tropes for the most part, successful tropes, successful human tropes, tropes that have been around for at least millennia, if not longer, in the human species, and ones that human beings uh, either cherish or value or appreciate uh, on a very great level. If that weren't the case, these tropes wouldn't uh, be there, be it the dragonborn, the inquisitor, the hero for Reldon, whatever that trope might be, heroism is a, obviously, <laughs> a persistent trope we encounter in fantasy. It probably is the most persistent trope. Now, you could argue that Becoming a hero is a form of escapism from the drudgery of daily life for some, uh, projecting oneself, seeing oneself in that hero. I think that is a limited view. I don't think it's entirely accurate, though it's accurate only partially for the following reasons. You see, much of what fantasy is is projecting the best of what is on hand in reality. Fantasy is not so much disparate and different from reality so much as it is uh, what reality uh, ca could be or can be in the best case scenario in the eyes of human beings. Now, what do I mean by this? When I say the best case scenario, what hu be human beings, in a general sense, uh, cherish and value and appreciate? What are some of these things? Heroism, uh, love stories, all these th th traditional elements you encounter, and specifically in high fantasy games. But there's more to this. Human beings outside of the fantasy world, in the real world that we occupy still at this point in juncture in time, in history, we are guided by what I like to term the autopilot function, which is just my overarching term for the collection of behaviors we have assembled due to millennia, and indeed in the case of hominid ancestors, millions of years of evolutionarily programmed behavioral uh, traits. And this is then obviously encoded and codified in our genome and then expressed in the environment. And there is, a, of course, a uh, feedback loop between the two. But most of what we do is not conscious. Most of what we want, what we find desirable, what we find uh, to be good, uh, what we appreciate, these are not... Uh, created or brought about based on conscious evaluation on the part of the individuals making those evaluations. Few people actually undergo the process of, this is why I like this, they cite the reasons. Now, it's not the case that they can't do that. Uh, when they do, though, most often it's simply a narrative. The reasons uh, remain somewhat mysterious. And so much, as, much of what we do as human beings in the real world is guided by essentially guttural instinct, whether they like it or not, that is the case. It's well documented. And we can see this in fantasy. Why am I talking about this? Well, there was a, a poll for a race, class, and gender uh, a while back on the BSN. And we can see this is an informal poll, but it is nonetheless a set of data, a set of real data, I think, uh, of over, I believe, a thousand participants in this particular uh, poll, 1,097, uh, 1, so that's a substantial set of people. And what we see is that the top five occupants were all human. 
Number one was the female human mage, two male human warrior, three male human mage, four female human warrior, five female human rogue, and then six female elf mage that was also popular, and male human rogue being the only human outside of the top brackets. Uh, the other stuff is primarily occupied by the low female Kunari mages, uh, and you do actually get a dwarf uh, rogue, female dwarf rogue at nine. The rest of the dwarves uh, tend to be much further down, uh, and so on and so forth. But what we see in the top uh, occupied spots are all occupied by humans. Now, you can look at this and then say, well, this is, of course, people trying to escape, projecting themselves onto their character. But I think it's, that's a misinterpretation. What that actually is, to my mind, is people looking for what is familiar. People not trying to pursue fantasy, but pursue reality within the fantasy world. Humans have always been, based on the, the, the studies I've seen, if you want to call these studies, these polls, the most popular characters in games where the option of multiple races is offered. People pursue humans. I almost never do, but then I, and I go against the grain in many ways. Most people do. And I think this is simply due to the fami familiarity. People see in fantasy not necessarily themselves, but they seek the familiar. Uh, the fantasy world is, at best, an optimization of the best traits that people seek in reality. This poll indicates that. Other things, why do dwarves tend to be less popular? I've cited this before. I'll be posting a link to a Forbes article which cites several studies. Well, tall people get paid more. One example, a 2004 study by Timothy Judge at the University of Florida found that for every inch of height, a tall worker can expect to earn an extra $789 per year. That, that means two equally skilled coworkers would have a pay differential of nearly $5,000 per year simply because of a six-inch height differential, according to the study. And it goes on about fat people being paid less and blondes being paid more and so on and so forth. And why I'm mentioning this, why I'm linking this, is simply to uh, point out that we, we all suffer from cognitive biases, uh, all of us, no matter how aware we might think we are of them. And we apply these cognitive biases when we are playing a fantasy game. In fact, fantasy is, is the composition of human cognitive biases. All the tropes that we, uh, enjoy, that we envision and appreciate and participate in are the, uh, ultimately the product of human cognitive biases, the things that we uh, like or love to the exclusion of other things. The other things are, are much rarer to find in fantasy games. There's a reason why certain things are just repeated over and over and over again. Uh, most fantasy games... Do not try to reinvent the wheel. Uh, they try to work with the wheel, with the spokes of the wheel, within the context of that wheel. And the better they work with that wheel, the more success they tend to have, the more appreciated they are. Completely trying to reinvent the wheel uh, usually doesn't go well. Uh, we saw that, for example, in the case of Mass Effect 3's ending and among other things. That was an attempt to reinvent the wheel of ending a trilogy. It didn't work. It was a, an utter disaster, and that is being generous and saying that. And we see that that doesn't work. So what I'm saying here is simply that we have multiple cognitive biases that we all bring to the table when we are participating in fantasy. Some of us less so than others. And I'm going to argue people who self-insert probably suffer uh, to a much greater extent these cognitive biases than people who don't. I think the more... Uh, the more you're aware of these cognitive biases, the less likely you are to self-insert yourself into a fantasy world. I do not insert myself. I tend to be pretty in touch with reality. And I'm pretty detached when it comes to the character I'm playing. Right now, I am trying, grindingly trying to finish my Androstian uh, Dwarf Warrior. Uh, this is not a character I see myself in at all. I am highly irreligious. But nonetheless, something I wanted to experiment with and I wanted to see the outcome of. So escapism is an, is an easy way of looking at it, and I suppose that could you could still allow for the term. It's not a clear-cut black-and-white issue. But I think rather than using the term escapism, 
we can use the term encapsulation. Uh, the encapsulation of reality, what people want from reality, projected onto a fantasy game. Now, some elements in a fantasy game are clearly unrelated to reality. You know, fire or frost-breathing dragons, and uh, you know, ancient magister darkspawn and what have you. There are, are always fantastical elements in any fantasy game that, at least at this current moment in time in history, we don't have access to. Uh, I'm, there probably never was a blight in our reality and never will be. But the things that draw people in are, are the tropes. Now, one the way you can see this, uh, one point that illustrates this apart from, uh, and, and it illustrates the cognitive biases, part of this, this informal poll uh, in addition to that, is I would argue people's lack of heed to the, the plot, to story. Now, those of you who know Smud Boy, I recently, yesterday actually, I did an interview with him, and he'll be posting that on his channel in a few days, I think. But most people on, say, the Bioware sociopathy forums tend to be enthralled with the game, they have multiple playthroughs and this and that. They don't care much about the story. They care about the Cullen romance or... They care about party banter, and I like the party banter for the most part. But they're not, they're not looking at the game as, as a complex, interwoven series of stories amalgama uh, or an amalgamation of, of all those stories into one story. They're, just, they're looking at all the little things, the party banter. That's the, those are the things they appreciate. Now, I can perfectly see their viewpoint in the sense that if you're not interested in plot, if you're not interested in, in story integrity, then, yeah, it's, it's a great game on some level. You get to interact with the characters for the, a, a fair degree. Um, there are some kind of nice ro romances. I'm using the word nice to describe it because I can't think of anything else. But what do people value in real life? Uh, most people value human relationships in real life. Most people don't like taking apart... Most people aren't economists. They don't study uh, the socioeconomics. They don't study the world. Uh, they, they are just, you know, people just do what they do. They interact with people. Most people are not taking real life under a microscope. And I think you'll see a similar thing when it comes to fantasy games. Those people who do tend to look at life from a more analytical perspective and a more detached perspective will also be applying that in all likelihood to the fantasy game. And... Once again, this reinforces what I believe to be cognitive biases. People who self-project for the most part uh, are the people who are seeking the same things that they would normally would have in life in, in the game uh, rather than, than other elements. Uh, but anyway, I don't want to go on about this too long. I wanted to offer an alternative perspective on what uh, self-insertion might be. I'm not completely disregarding or discarding the term escapism, but I think there might be other terms that uh, fit just as well, if not better. Anyway, thanks for watching, and I will see you soon, uh, most likely with another companion review. Everyone take care, and as always, may the gods watch over you. Bye-bye.